Six cores are the gaming CPU sweet spot in 2022. Even modern quad cores will find themselves holding back GPUs in heavier titles, whereas the games that benefit from eight cores are just not that common yet. Of course, six core CPUs are really only just starting to become accessible to the majority of PC builders. Until a few years ago, they've been exclusive to the upper echelons of enthusiasts and professionals. These HEDT processors were so elite, in fact, that pricing on many of them still to this day makes them unappealing in a world where an i5-10400F costs 75 quid. Is there a reason, then, why anyone would consider gaming on an i7-3960X in 2022? The i7-3960X was made for the first revision of Socket 2011, attached to the X79 chipset. This socket ran for two generations, those being the Sandy Bridge E-based 3000 series and the later Ivy Bridge E4000 series. The desktop 3000 and 4000 series chips were Ivy Bridge and Haswell respectively, so looking back it can be a little confusing and you might wonder why high-end chips would be based on older architectures. I suspect the reason for the confusion may have been down to a bit of poor marketing. The 3960X launched in quarter 4 2011, at a time when the regular desktop models were branded as 2000 series. I guess they maybe went with the higher model number to make it clear that this was a tier above the i7-2600 and 2700, which would have been fine if they hadn't then gone and launched a whole 3000 series of CPUs on a newer architecture. The chip itself is a bit on the chunky side, a fair amount larger than the 1155 CPUs of the day, and bigger even than some modern processors. Underneath this big ol' heat spreader are six Sandy Bridge cores, running at a base frequency of 3.3GHz, capable of increasing to 3.9GHz via Turbo Boost 2.0, and with an unlocked multiplier allowing for some more serious overclocks. It's not just the extra cores that separate the 3960X from its desktop brethren either, it has a relatively huge 15 megabytes of onboard cache, compared to the 8 megabytes that remained standard on desktop i7s, all the way up to the 7th generation KB Lake series. Although this era of CPUs only supported DDR3 RAM, the HEDT platforms of the time had the rare distinction of working with more than two memory channels, meaning for higher bandwidth at the same clock speeds. Of course, despite being a marvel of the year 2011, the 3960X is showing its age in 2022. From a technological standpoint, Sandy Bridge is far behind modern Intel and AMD architectures in terms of performance per clock, and its instruction sets aren't exactly the most modern available. By today's standards too, the 3960X isn't at all efficient, with a rated 130 watt TDP that goes even higher once you start overclocking. Then there's the price. Not of the CPU though, the 3960X itself cost me £55, less than a Ryzen 5 1500. Note the biggest upfront cost comes from motherboards, which historically don't have the same durability as CPUs. The original X79 boards from recognisable brands like Asus, Gigabyte, ASRock and MSI are harder to find in working order as time goes on, and therefore more expensive. While there is a solution from China, in the form of new motherboards assembled from recycled chipsets in order to help sell the vast quantities of X-Server Socket 2011 Xeons being sold online, I have no personal experience of these, so if you'd like to know more about them, I'd point you in the direction of Kraft Computing and Mirkonst Hardware. For my test setup today, I'm using a Gigabyte X79 UD3 I picked up in a second-hand system bought from UK retailer CEX, and I'm using a Cooler Master 240mm AIO to help keep temperatures in check. I've populated the four RAM slots with 4GB DDR3 sticks, clocked at 2133CL11, and to help reduce the likelihood of a GPU bottleneck, I'm using an RTX 3070. For comparison, I also have some results from my personal PC, a Ryzen 5 5600X with 32GB of DDR4 3600CL16, and the same GPU. After grabbing a few synthetic benchmarks at stock speeds and not being all that impressed, I decided to try my hand at overclocking. 
I'd originally hoped to hit 4.6 GHz or higher, but after a lot of stress testing I found that it just wouldn't maintain those clocks for more than a few seconds, and the more I tried to increase voltages and power limits, the worse my results were. I settled on 4.5 GHz at 1.45 volts, which the CPU was able to sustain throughout all my testing, while maintaining a decidedly lukewarm 50 degrees in gaming. Considering my stress testing had seen the 4.6 GHz OC reach 80 plus degree peak temperatures, I've got to say this is pretty remarkably civilised for an extreme CPU. Anyway, benchmarks. Starting with Valorant, a game that loves cache and single thread CPU performance, and doesn't really care about GPU horsepower much. At 1440 max settings, averages broke 200 FPS. This is less than 10% higher than the quad-core i7-3820, which was the entry-level option for this CPU socket, and shows how little regard Valorant has for large numbers of CPU cores. The bigger advantage is in 1% lows, which saw over 30% higher frame rates compared to the quad-core. Of course, not all online games are so graphically undemanding. Battlefield 5 combines large open spaces, destructible environments and high player counts, making for a challenge to both CPUs and GPUs. I'm still running at 1440 high, and this saw an average FPS exceeding 100, but was still a pretty horrible experience overall. The 1% lows tell the story here. Despite the very acceptable averages, the frame pacing was all over the place and made for non-stop stuttering for large portions of the match. I don't know if this is something that goes away after a few rounds, like Fortnite's stutter, but I didn't have two more hours to spare testing one game. Speaking of Fortnite, the meta bounces back and forth between regular and performance modes, but performance is the one I thought would be most likely to be CPU limited. Once more at 1440 max settings, this time with DLSS quality enabled, the average hits a mighty 200 FPS and 1% lows of 110. This is, again, a modest step up from the 3820, with most of the benefit appearing in the 1% lows, but still makes for a good experience. Overwatch 2 is aesthetically pretty similar to the original 2016 release, and even though it's a little more demanding, it's still designed to give some nice big FPS numbers, but it's also mostly GPU bound. At 1440 epic settings, averages are 158, and unlike the 3820, the 3960X is not fully utilising the CPU. Dropping to 66% render scaling sees a 40% increase in FPS, averaging over 200 and with 1% scores in the low 150s. With the big numbers out of the way, I thought I'd try a few single-player games that are traditionally GPU-bound but still put a fair amount of stress on the CPU. Starting with Marvel's Spider-Man, whose slightly scaled-down Manhattan should provide something of a challenge. At 1440 very high with DLSS quality and very high ray tracing, the 3960X is still holding the RTX 3070 back. The average dips a little below 60 and 1% lows actually drop into the 30s. Cutting RT makes for a simple way of maintaining a higher frame rate, swinging up to 82 FPS on average. Just like New York City, Night City pushes more than just your graphics card. Cyberpunk is a CPU stressor with or without RT, and it seems to really like the extra threads of the 3960X over its quad-core companion. 
This i7 runs on my non-RT configuration at over 60 FPS on average with lows in the 40s and pretty acceptable 0.1% lows to match. Switching on Ultra RT and dropping DLSS to balance still sees performance drop by almost 20% but is very playable and looks stunning. Compared to the 3820, all of these numbers are a huge jump, about 10 FPS higher in the RT test and 15 FPS higher in the non-RT. In fact, these results are only a few frames lower than the Ryzen 5 5600X. Red Dead Redemption 2's wide open plains and mountains should provide some challenge for the 3960X, but not as much as the city of Saint Denis. After going for a canter through the cobbled streets, I saw an average FPS of 76 and lows of 52. Like Cyberpunk, this is a phenomenal increase over the frames I saw with the 3820. 20 FPS better averages and 16 FPS better 1%. Considering this is a port of an 8th gen console game, this is a pretty surprising result. Elden Ring should be a simple one to benchmark, it caps at 60 FPS after all, but there's a little more nuance to it than that. At 1440 max settings, a modern mid-range CPU like the Ryzen 5 5600X can keep close to a 60 FPS experience, but older, weaker CPUs do have some difficulty processing the game's open world. 1% lows on the 3960X drop to just about 40 FPS, and 0.1% fall as far as 20. While this is a drop from modern CPUs, it's a huge leap from the quad-core i7-3820, which failed to hit a 50fps average in my test. Finally, I wanted something a little more overtly CPU-focused, and a couple of people suggested something from the 4X genre. I haven't bought a game like that in uh, decades, but thankfully I'd somehow managed to end up with a copy of Civ 6 in my Epic Games Store library. I haven't actually played the game, so I don't have a decent sized civilization of my own yet, so I resorted to the built in AI benchmark, which scores an average turn time of 7.05 seconds, 0.52 seconds faster than the i7-3820, which I'm sure is a very good, important performance difference for Civ fans. On that note, here are some more numbers, which I'm sure will mean something to someone. There's a pretty stark contrast between the games tested today. Some titles like Fortnite, Battlefield 5, and Valorant don't see a huge uptick in performance from the quad core i7 3820. Although they are using all available cores and threads to some extent, their FPS doesn't scale to 6 cores as you might expect. Their 10 to 15% increase in averages is perhaps more to do with the 3960X's higher overclock, bigger cache, or both. On the other hand, some titles are clearly leveraging the extra threads being offered. Perhaps surprisingly, it's the AAA Visual Safari type games that benefit most, especially those with ray tracing, which going forwards is probably going to be most of them. What remains to be seen is whether older CPUs with more than 6 cores are worth looking into, and that's something I hope to do soon. In summary then, as I said earlier, X79 doesn't have much of a place in this world for someone buying a whole new system but there are still valid scenarios in which you might find yourself. If you already have an i7-3960X or the slightly faster 3970X, you've got a damn fine CPU there. Overall, performance-wise, it has a couple of areas of weakness. I'm looking at you, Battlefield 5, but on the whole, I think you should be good for a little while longer. If you can stomach the energy bills, at 4.5 GHz, this thing uses roughly twice as much electricity as modern 6 cores. Current X79 owners looking for a value upgrade from something like the i7-3820 could do worse than the 3960X, certainly, but I think there's an even better value option, one that costs less to buy, less to run, and which performs about the same. 
I'll be looking at that CPU next week, and once the video's live, it will be linked on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.